Hey there, welcome to our podcast in a one-on-one -on -one setting, uh, where we dive into the stories of hot new technologies in the geospatial space and learn from the founders behind them. My name is Roos van der Maas, and I'm co-founder of Ellipsis Drive, and here with me is our guest, Andy Bowyer. Uh, Andy, please tell us more about you and your journey up to uh, founding uh, Clio Space. Uh, thanks for uh, having us on the show, Rosalie. Um, yeah, so uh, my background is in space exploration, space engineering. Um, I co-founded a space engineering firm in 2005 in the UK, uh, which did some really cool stuff. Um, uh, uh, X-ray spectrometers going to Mercury, um, instruments going to Mars to look for life, things like that. A lot of, lot of fun. As the new space sector started to evolve and um, got more involved in how we could use some of the science and physics that we were working on uh, on new space uh, satellites, so smaller satellites, uh, quicker, cheaper, uh, how we get satellites into orbit faster to deliver services that are useful to useful to customers. So we took some science we were working on, uh, spun it out and founded the company Cleos, um, which was, you know, we then had to go and raise some capital and create a business that uh, that launched satellites, owned and operated them, um, collected data, and then delivered a service out of the back end of that. So very quick uh, run through. That's certainly quick. So um, what would be the the basics of the value that Cleos brings to market? Because um, it's like quite a special constellation that, that you're going for yourselves. So yeah please give us some more background on um, what makes that special, like the, the basics of the value behind it. Yeah, so we're working in an area of Earth observation, which is sort of a new area of Earth observation, the uh, RF geolocation. So using satellites uh, to collect data about how the spectrum is being used and where the radio spectrum is being used, particularly with communication devices, uh, radar devices, things like that. And then we bring that data down to the ground, process it through a range of different algorithms to create a geospatial point on a map, which is where we've seen a radio emitter or a radio transmitter being used. As I said, whether that is a communication device or whether it's a, a, a radar, sort of navigational radar on board a ship being used, and we're able to geolocate those very, very accurately. That information then gives the user of that geospatial data an insight into the world around them. That's very complementary to other Earth, Earth observation data sets like imagery or SAR. Because what we're able to do is look at wide, very, very wide areas of the Earth, like vast, you know, the whole of the continent of Europe in one pass. We have a huge swath with our capability. Um, and so if we're able to find sort of hidden human activity, particularly around borders or coastlines, things like that, where uh, perhaps they're being affected by illegal fishing or illegal smuggling of people or drugs or you know weapons or whatever it might be, then it gives the analyst the ability to look for human activity they're not expecting to be there and then tip and cue other Earth observation data sets, whether, as I say, imagery or SAR predominantly, because that then gives the layer as to what is going on. We're saying where something's going on, but the imagery obviously confirms really what is happening here. Is it two ships coming together? Is it ship to shore type communication? Um, is it in a ground-based environment? Perhaps it's a hidden activity within the tree canopy, so illegal mining, for, in the, for example, in the Amazon, uh, where we can see through the tree canopy where we can see human radioactivity uh, or emitters being used, transmitters being used uh, beneath that tree canopy where other sources are taken to just see green. And so it gives an insight with regard what's happening around the world that uh, is very, very complementary to other Earth observation geospatial data sets. Yeah, and I personally think like this is this is truly quite amazing. Indeed, when you're used to um, Earth observation, most people indeed think about imagery, either SAR or spectral, uh, hyperspectral, if you're already getting somewhat creative. But radio frequency really adds an extra layer to the possibilities of of the unseen that can become seen. How long has this technology been around, and and how long has it been like operationally used? Like, are you a front runner? Are you one of the companies that is effectively commercializing this technology? Like, could you give us a bit of history um, of radio frequency and uh, yeah, monitoring that from space? I think I think the, the the techniques and the technology have been around for a very long time. Um, the the physics is obviously very well known. Uh, we're essentially using a reverse of the GPS 
science, um, where if you're, um, you know, a uh, if you're using GPS satellites, the satellites themselves are emitting uh, information about where they are and and the timing. You're collecting that with your phone or your car, or whatever it might be, and performing the maths as to working out your location in relation to those satellites. It will do that the other way around and have a single transmitter. You need to receive that signal at multiple points in order to do that same multilateration calculation in order to work out the position of the transmitter. So that science, that physics has been around for a long time, whether it's been used in airfields to locate the uh, aircraft coming in in the Second World War or whatever it might be. There's the, the that physics and science is, is certainly well established and well known. I think in terms of a space-based uh, capability, there's only one or two countries in the world who have a, a government type ability to do this. Um, that is a, it's a very, very expensive uh, capability, historically speaking. Um, and it's a, it's a very, very complicated technique to, to get right. So it was the preserve of probably one or two governments for a very long time. I think from a commercial delivery perspective, it's, uh, it's very nascent. So it's maybe five to six years old in terms of satellites being in orbit, orbit commercially in order to do this. Um, our first satellites launched in 2020 um, in terms of the demonstration mission. So it's very, very new. We're one of probably two or three uh, of the kind of leaders around the world uh, delivering a, the, this commercial capability. And we're all interesting, we're all doing it slightly differently. So the, those, even those two or three data sets become complementary in their own rights as well, because we're going about the science in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a it's, a, it's a super new industry. I think the, the difficulty about it being so new is actually bringing online all of those adopters, users of the data, because you have to educate the vast majority of the uh, of the of the world in terms of you have to educate the customers, you have to educate what the use cases there are and how it's going to be useful to them from a from a, uh, a science perspective or from a, uh, a surveillance perspective. So giving them that information, educating is really been the, the challenge over the last few years. Yeah, I imagine the 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 downsides of the green field there. Um, are you I imagine you are. Are you also targeting like the, the government use cases that have been around for longer? I mean, your gut feeling obviously tells you that this is quite quite a, a spy crafty technique almost um, that is used a lot in, in, in defense and intelligence. Is that also a market vertical that uh, your business is going after? Or are you like slicing out um, a piece of commercial like greenfield market? Um, yeah. What's your what's your play there? Yeah. Our, uh... I sense really the early adopter is the government customer, um, whether that is a sort of, you know, defense with a big D customer is, is a sort of questionable thing, or whether it's more of a, a small D type customer, because those that are looking after, you know, the coastlines and policing, um, let's say for, for human trafficking, things like that. It, that's a defense application still mm -hmm. very much. Um, and it is the defense entities and agencies that are policing those uh, security concerns. So it is very much defense and security. So even um, entities that are looking for, let's say, uh, 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 illegal fishing um, in uh, in vast parts of the world, that's policed again by navies and generally a defense a defense application, a defense security application, whether that's security, creating security around your environment or your, uh, or your overseas assets or your um, uh, financial interests around the world. It's all really defense and security. So we see that as very much our big marketplace to begin with. That's a sort of early adopter type marketplace. As pricing comes down, as volume goes up and customer adoption goes up, then that's where other marketplaces open up and particularly around uh, commercial entities still interested in security. So whether this is, you know, um, unmanned assets that might be in a desert or in a maritime environment, um, uh, looking at risk factors around the world. Where is there a lot of, let's say, you know, perhaps pirate type activity or uh, insecure waterways? How do we better secure those from an insurance perspective? So I think there's a broader application uh, across all of those domains. And I think that's very similar to 
uh, tropical injury or even siren injury, where the early, early adopters are still the government and defense uh, customers to begin with. And then as pricing comes down and utility goes up, then you open up the other layers of, of commerciality as well. So I think we're following a similar path, but we're a bit, we're a few years behind, obviously, those are the phenomena. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. But this is a very heavy lift for, for a startup. <laughs> Um, so do you see other businesses that are doing um, radio frequency um, analysis as your allies here in a way? Because you mentioned yourself, like in the end, if the market's big enough um, and you're all doing something slightly different, it is all complementary. Do you see them as as allies in making this market happen, also the commercial side of it, or or is it more complex than that? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think that there is a... Um... Uh, you know, they're not necessarily like, you know, written down, agreed allies, but I think that there is a, um, a, a marketplace that needs to be built by multiple players existing within it. Um, and, you know, a single source of data, whether it was electro-optical, um, you know, planet wouldn't exist without perhaps, you know, the Maxars or the uh, Black Skies or other groups sort of developing the overall commercial marketplace for electro-optical imagery. Um, and it was a uh, it was a sort of, you know, a village, took a village to really create that uh, market and that whole ecosystem. And I think it's similar really in our domain as well, where you have to, you have to create enough pull and infrastructure and competition and, you know, driving the businesses forward to really make a success of it. So yeah, I'd, I'd say, I'd say again, we're following a similar, you know, path to the EO guys. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. And so, um, the product that you're, uh, that you're launching, it is, uh, following a data as a service model. Is that correct? Or, um, yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So could so you it's, tell, it's... yeah, please elaborate. I'm curious. Yeah. So it, we're, Again, we're not doing anything, you know, unique or novel here. We're trying to uh, launch a product in a way which is understandable and um, recognizable to the customer base already. So those are used to buying data as a service. So we have a service level agreement, which is, you know, we deliver a certain amount of data over a monthly period um, with certain requirements and capabilities that are, are required to be achieved within that service level agreement. Could you... Could you actually make that concrete? Like, what are the types of things that clients may expect from you? Like radio frequency, um, uh, or like timeliness, or um, the 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 frequency of the swaths. Like, what is what is the sort of the quality yeah, level that you're able to deliver on? So what we do is we specify um, what we call a standard collection zone. So where we are different than let's say an imagery company, mm -hmm. with the exception of maybe Planet. Um, is that we 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 don't really facilitate tasking per se. Um, we find that that is a quite an inefficient way of running, particularly RF satellites. So what we do is we specify a very large standard collection zone, continent level. So not you know, sort of football stadium type level, which you might get with an imagery company. Continent level standard collection zones, and we collect over that standard collection zone every day. So that's a sort of first level of, of capability where we have a daily SCZ or standard collection zone that we deliver in terms of a revisit, right? And then as we have more satellites online, then you see that same area more often. And then obviously the subscription values go up on that basis. So we price on an SCZ basis with the concept being that within that SCZ is that you've got multiple customers with much smaller AOIs. Somebody might just be interested in the coast of Sicily or they might just be interested in the English Channel or um, you know, the, the Spanish French border or whatever it might be. There's a, lots of small customer AOIs within that, but they all pay the same amount for that large volume of data because in that way they end up all paying less because we can divide the cost by many more customers. So it allows us to amortize that cost out more. So whilst that means that most customers get a bit more than they wanted, then in terms of overall data set, 
they pay a lot less for it. And then with, you know, geofencing and everything else, you can obviously, rest- you know, they can make it easy for them to filter out just the data they want. So that's the standard, sort of standard delivery concept and, and pricing model that we, we follow on that basis. And then as we deliver more SCZs and we deliver them more often, then obviously pricing goes up or the number of customers that goes up. Gotcha. Yeah, so that's... That's actually quite interesting. Like that, there is a distinct difference between, indeed, how imagery goes about this. Like you're, you're saying that you're aiming to stay close to that model because it's indeed something that people are already used to. So that only helps your go to market. But at the same time, it does sound like with radio frequency data, the problem of scale is less of a problem just because the swaths are as big as they are in the first place. Like um, I have many conversations with uh, satellite operators that are looking to do huge deals um, that are like spanning indeed continents, but then um, that that scale uh, sort of throws a wrench into works when it comes to cost and uh, what people are actually looking to spend. Is that volume or scale problem difference for for your type of business would you say yeah it it is it is different um i think what we you know in terms of the way that we collect and deliver the data set because we're looking at such wide areas you have to think about it in that context and so it makes particularly as a the size of business that we are as well, some of this is driven because of this, the scale and size of, of our business, is that it's quite impractical for us to do, you know, tasking on a very sort of micro transaction or micro collect type perspective, you know, as this sort of, you know, football stadium type application. It, it's, it's impractical. It doesn't, it, it would drive the costs up phenomenally 10 times in order for us to actually deliver a taskable kind of capability. So what we try and do is, is aggregate requirements to make it more cost effective for people. So part of the, dri- the, the driver there is it opens up the product to a much wider group of people because the pricing has come down, but it also makes it more practical for us to actually deliver that um, at our sort of scale of business of operating satellites and being able to deliver a capability. Because most of our, our engineering heavy lift which is probably slightly unusual in, in our sector is it's all on the ground. So, you know, uh, we have many more processing engineers and uh, data guys and uh, then we do space people because our tech is really on the ground in terms of science and algorithms and technologies and techniques. Uh, and we're constantly improving those algorithms and, and increasing the capability in terms of geolocation accuracies. So we have, that's, a, that's really a ground-based capability so the, the the more we can simplify the space sensor part the collection mm-hmm. part the better really is in terms of our business model mm, understood cool so um to what degree is like the surveillance system that you can basically deliver to customers at scale customizable uh, like you mentioned like a lot of the smart stuff happens here on earth um, what does that bring um, a customer or what can it bring a customer in, in the future in, in terms of like, yeah, customizable intelligence? Well, it's in terms of customizing the spacecraft themselves, not a lot because the, they are fixed in terms of payload that they're on board the satellites. You can change the frequencies that we're looking at a little bit. But it is, you know, they're relatively fixed. We can't just change to another band because we've got fixed antennas and things. So it's really on the ground in terms of um, in terms of developing more intelligence. Where at the moment we provide geospatial data um, with some metadata around that. But what we're wanting to do is create more intelligence products around that, so that it enables it. E- it, it, it enables it to be easier to ingest by the customer as well and speed up their workflow. So these are part of sort of future developments. So there's not there's not a lot of tweakability from a customer perspective, but I think we can add more value to the data as we as we develop and, and grow as a business. Okay. Yeah. And and that makes sense. And and along that thought, um, what are the hurdles that you're that you're seeing and that you're looking to overcome in terms of getting the intelligence you're producing into the hands of end users? Like, what's what's the gap that needs to be bridged between you know data on a sheet and actual production situations? 
Uh, could you walk think, us through that? Yeah, I think it's it's really about um, uh, sort of traditional market adoption of new technology and particularly new earth observation technology. Um, our, our technology is more um, abstract than an image where an image, anybody can look at it and say, hmm, well, that's, you know, a pretty picture of this. Um, so it is, it's more abstract in terms of what's going on in the RF, uh, RF domain. So how we can make that data more ingestible or more value add uh, by you know using something like ellipsis drive which has really enabled us to create those different layers which are very easy to visualize from a customer perspective so they can look at a particular layer they can use the thumbnail find an area that they're interested in click on that view it that's opening up our ability to uh, work with those customers that aren't used to working with this sort of data set which is 99% of them, because only one or two really around the world are used to working with this data uh, set. So it's it's about opening up that market adoption by making it easier to ingest um, uh, in a wide range, as many different ways as we possibly can. And, and do you feel you're only scratching the surface there, or do you have a solid understanding of what it will take to get this like properly integrated into the day-to-day -day of a lot of people working defense, security, intelligence, et cetera? Yeah, I think, I think we've got a good grip of that, uh, but we are only scratching the surface of actually doing it. Um, mm -hmm. So it is a, uh, you know, we're very, very sort of early on. I think, you know, we, we're we still we're very much working on uh, exploiting, not exploiting, executing against the early adopter need mm -hmm. um, and, and delivering against that sort of requirement. Um, and we're starting to move beyond that into the wider community, you know, South American countries, those countries in, uh, um, you know, around the South China Sea that have territorial challenges. How do we work with, with those guys that have perhaps um, uh, sort of less sophisticated systems or just less people to do the work? So then that means we have to bring in more automation and more machine learning and more capabilities to enable the to do the analytic part for the customer so that's that's a sort of you know walking down that value chain uh, uh perspective again that just opens up more customers for us and then one of the last questions i have like where do you think the battle will be fought in terms of competition in this field will it be perhaps it's both probably both but will it be in the area of like frequency like who is able to detect what um, or will it be in the area of consumability, like who is able to get like, valuable intel into the hands of end users, um, like as hassle-free and as, as timely as possible? Like, where will the battle be fought, say, three years down the road? I think there's, to avoid the question, I think that there's probably three answers to that. Okay. Um, I, think, I think accessibility is a, is a critical one for market adoption. Um, and I think... The, the reason why it's not really an answer is because I think that once, you know, one, once that community has started working with this sort of data and that accessibility barrier has been broken through, it's really going to break this, that sort of ceiling from any supplier. I don't think that's necessarily a competitor based thing. I think that's just, we're all working towards making accessibility a key thing. Um, I think that, uh, I think that pricing is important for the wider community, not the early adopter community. So standardization, um, uh, the ability to, I'm not suggesting that we commoditize the pricing, but <laughs> pricing, being cognizant about the pricing is really important and, uh, and how we use pricing to open up the marketplace without devaluing the product i think is a is an interesting sort of path that we're, we're continuing to go on uh the the other area is really to do with technological development more broadly speaking around latencies so how we get data from collect to the customer in a more timely fashion so that is because our data volumes are very large it, it takes an 
amount of time to fly the satellite to a ground station, bring the data down, process that large volume of data on the ground and how you speed those things up. Some of that can be sped up through automation, through machine learning, through uh, capabilities that we can deploy over a period of time. Some of it though is beyond our scope, which is more in the space sector, improving ground station access, improving uh, going from perhaps LEO to NEO type into satellite link type capabilities. So, you know, these are challenges across the industry, whether you're a star company or an RF company or an EO company. I think that's a broad kind of um, latency opens up more opportunities because it opens up the applications to be much greater rather than looking at hours. If you're looking at minutes in terms of delivery, the world changes in terms of applications uh, a lot at that point. So I think that's that's more of a broader technological um, sort of battle space. And then mm -hmm. I think whoever's working at the forefront of accessibility, of timeliness and latency, and also getting those pricing elements at the right level, I think will be, you know, sort of pushing forward and, and leading the market. And of course, all of that is is part of your strategy as well. Like you're looking to yeah, be we, that we have a detailed, we have a detailed roadmap where we're following these paths uh, through to ensure that we, um, you know, uh, can grow the business and, and deliver in terms of what the customer needs over the longer term. Absolutely. All right. So fast forward to the end of this year, and then looking back at 2023, um, what were the biggest milestones that you will have hit by then? I think by the end of 23, we will have our, if you like, our, our mini constellation uh, all operational by that point. Um, uh, the, you know, the next few months will go from uh, two or three satellites operational through to nine to 10 satellites operational by the end of the year. So the volumes of data are going to be much larger, amounts of revisit rates are going to be much greater, um, and the sort of overall customer capability and you know, ability to deliver against requirements is going to be much larger. So I think that that is a, uh, you know, we are on the hockey stick of capability this this year, that, that's for sure. That's super exciting to hear. And yeah, I think you have an ecosystem at the ready to, to make sure you can keep delivering on requirements um, as data becomes available, because I think out of out of all the data that's being produced, radio frequency data has an obvious value. And I think it's all about, you know, packaging that into something that's consumable, into something that is affordable to loads of organizations across the globe who can who can make very good use of this. So yeah. um that's right. yeah. yeah. It's 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 truly great to have you. Um we'll we'll keep um We'll keep our eye out for for what will be happening, and and hopefully we'll we'll be able to get um, an update, perhaps through this medium, uh, say in the first quarter of next year, uh, see how yes, how all of this yes. is playing out. Um, and then for now, thanks so much for for sharing. Um, no, no problem at all. We're we're big fans of the Hudson's Drive. Um, it's uh, it's a big part of our you know uh, help very helpful part of our rollout strategy and and it's a big work stream for us in terms of how we can get data to groups of entities and customers in, in that sense so we we get a lot of value out of it um it's filled a big gap for us that we had uh and is opening up as i said those opportunities to help the users that perhaps aren't uh, uh as as a sort of understanding of the capability so it's yeah it's been it's bridged a big gap for us so yeah we're we're um uh, big fans and advocates of Ellipsis Drive all the time. Oh, that that's that's truly nice to hear. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll be here for the rest of the journey. And um, yeah, th th thanks for spending the time and and sharing this story. Uh, thanks, so much, much appreciated. No problem at all. Until See the next soon. one. Thanks. Bye.